19-year-old Angel Edna Karlick has disappeared from Whitehorse, the capital of Yukon Territory. Police brushed it off, assuming she's just another teenage runaway. Over five months go by before her badly decomposed body is found. This won't be the only tragedy for the Karlick family. Did police drop the ball on looking for Angel? And what happened almost exactly a decade later? This is the final episode of season one of Cold Canada. Episode 13, A Yukon Tragedy. In the Yukon alone, 42 indigenous women and girls have gone missing or have been murdered since the 1950s. The following episode showcases two of those women's stories. Situated on the west coast of Canada and referred to as the Wilderness City, Whitehorse is the largest city in northern Canada. With a population of just over 25,000, Whitehorse contains 70% of the entire population of the Yukon Territory, according to a 2016 census. Previously named Dawson City, it started as the transport hub during the Klondike Gold Rush in 1898. Dawson City was renamed Whitehorse and deemed the capital in 1953. It was named after the Whitehorse Rapids, which resembled the mane of a white horse before being dammed. When you think of Northern Canada, you think of frigid temperatures and a lot of snow. But Whitehorse is one of the mildest towns in comparison to other Northern communities due to its relative proximity to the Pacific Ocean. Its annual average temperature is zero degrees Celsius and boasts as the warmest place in the Yukon. In 2013, the capital city was named the least polluted city in the entire world by the Guinness Book of World Records. Despite it being a low pollution area, poverty was and still is at a high rate. Low income families make up approximately 11% of the population. In a study completed in 2012, it was found the housing prices in the capital city have risen by 80% and the vacancy rate was just 1.3%, making it difficult not only to find housing, but to find affordable housing, leaving a lot of people to turn to the streets. Over the years, the Yukon Territory has been a low crime area, reporting either zero or one homicide per year since 1961. But that drastically changed in the millennium. From 2000 to 2018, there have been 35 homicides and 12 of those are still unsolved. In 2018 alone, eight people were murdered, which is the highest reporting homicide rate of all time for the territory and there have only been charges laid in two out of those eight cases. The police are now overwhelmed and investigations are unsustainable for police to handle. The government of Yukon planned on spending $1 million to fund a three-person task force dedicated to investigating the remaining unsolved crimes over three years, starting in 2018. There was new hope for the community having this dedicated task force, but between perishability of evidence and reluctant witnesses, the police had their work cut out for them. Angel Carlick was born June 11, 1988 in Dees Lake, British Columbia. Her mother moved her and her brothers to Whitehorse in an attempt to escape an abusive relationship. Angel didn't have an easy childhood. She spent most of her life homeless with her mother. She wanted more for herself and her family. In finding the Blue Feather Youth Center, she was able to get some help and guidance, and in May of 2007, she was getting ready to receive her high school diploma. This was a huge accomplishment for the teen. She wanted so badly to get her education and save money for a down payment on a home. She wanted a safe place for her family to live and get her younger brother out of the Yukon child welfare system. Angel had embraced sobriety, conquered school, and was well on her way to her final goal. She worked as the dinner program leader that helped provide dinners for children in need at the youth center that she claimed saved her life. Family and friends described Angel as a wonderful person who loved her job. She was ambitious and loved to paint. She had done multiple murals within the youth center, which showcased her artistic talent. When Angel didn't show up for work on May 28, 2007, her boss, Vicki Durant, who Angel knew since she was 14, became very concerned. 
It was out of character for her to not show up without calling, especially on payday. After not being able to get a hold of Angel, she called RCMP to report her missing. The police didn't seem very concerned at all. They brushed off Durant's alarm, telling her she was probably just a teen runaway. Vicky knew different. She knew Angel wouldn't abandon her family and that something was seriously wrong. She also knew that the first 48 hours in a missing persons case are critical and nothing was done by police and they missed out by not taking the report seriously. Angel was last seen on the evening of May 27th, 2007. She had left a friend's home and went towards downtown Whitehorse where she calls another friend from a payphone and makes plans to meet up with them. She never showed up and was never heard from since. Since police wouldn't do anything about it, Angel's mother, Wendy, and family friend, Irma Scarf, organized a community search to look for Angel. Over 40 people, friends, and strangers gathered and set out in search of the young girl. The downtown core, as well as outskirts of the town, was combed through, but no clues were discovered. Irma told CBC she was sad to see no RCMP officers had shown up for the search. Only one came down to tell them what to do if they did find any evidence. Wendy was distraught. She continued her search every single day for her daughter. She told the news Angel was the love of her life and she'll never stop looking for her. Nearly five and a half months later, on November 9th, 2007, a small body was discovered by a hiker in a wooded area at the base of Pilot Mountain, which is located approximately 40 minutes from downtown Whitehorse. The body was badly decomposed, suggesting the person had been dead quite a while. Police were called, and the body was taken into the medical examiner's office in an attempt to identify Jane Doe. The body was eventually identified as Mary Ann Birmingham. Her family was informed, and Wendy was understandably destroyed. The death was deemed suspicious, and an autopsy was performed, but due to the composition of the body, a cause of death or time of death was unable to be confirmed. It was unknown whether she died in the area where she was found, or if she was killed and dumped there. With no viable evidence, witness, or suspects to go on, the case goes cold. For nearly a decade, there is no movement in the case. Police contact Angel's family every April to give them an update, but the news is always that there are no new leads and the investigation is still ongoing. In a shocking and strange turn of events, Wendy Carlick, Angel's mother, is found murdered along with her longtime friend Sarah McIntosh in Sarah's home on April 10, 2017. It was believed the pair had been dead for at least 10 days before being discovered. The news of the murders was devastating for the community of Kowalan Dunn First Nations. Wendy was a mother to many and a well-known advocate for missing and murdered Indigenous women since Angel's death a decade prior. Santana Taylor, who was Angel's best friend, told the media Wendy was like a mother to her and the loss of the women was shattering to the entire community. No one could fathom what would lead someone to want to kill these two women. Similar to the other murder cases involving Indigenous women, there was not a lot of information on these homicides. There was no cause of death released or any details on how the women were murdered from what I could find. Community members are convinced there's a connection between this murder and Angel's, but the police continue to say otherwise. Later that year, at an event for the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls in Whitehorse, a family was giving their testimony when Alex Carlick, Angel's brother and Wendy's son, interrupted. He was never scheduled to speak, but in a raw emotional outburst, they let him go ahead. He wanted to express how losing his entire family has affected him. He stated with Angel's case being unsolved for so many years is a direct reflection on how police handle missing and murdered Indigenous women cases. Wendy's brother William also spoke out about the abuse both he and his sister encountered at a residential school and also at home later in life. There is a known continuous cycle that has gone on in the family and others' families alike. Children were taken away from their parents when they were young and sent into government care. 
parents turned to drugs and or alcohol to cope and children were abused at the school and were at home. Those children then raised children in a similar abusive manner. He also stated there was a normalization around abuse against women and children in the community. Between mental disorders, fetal alcohol syndrome, and generational abuse, no one seemed to care or bat an eye at the dysfunction. Angel was attempting to break this vicious cycle by succeeding and getting her brother out of the system by adopting him, despite coming from a broken home herself. A year later, in 2018, a break in the murder of Wendy and Sarah came through. Everett Chief is charged with second-degree murder in both Wendy and Sarah's death. Chief was already in custody for another crime when he was charged on May 28, 2018. The next day, the charges were upgraded to first-degree murder in the death of Karlick. The latest update on the case was from June 2020. There has been no sentencing yet. The courts are backlogged and delayed due to the pandemic. Police still stand firm. There is no connection between this case and the murder of Angel. To this day, Angel's case remains unsolved. Her artwork still hangs proudly at the youth center she worked at, and the members of the center have painted a mural in her honor. If you have any information related to this case, please contact the RCMP's M Division, Unsolved Crime Unit in Whitehorse or Crime Stoppers. As always, all that contact information will be in the episode notes. Well, this has been the season one finale of Cold Canada. I want to thank everyone who has tuned in this season and for the overwhelming support of this podcast. I've had so much fun researching and writing these episodes over the past few months. In case you missed my Instagram posts, I will be taking a break from the weekly episodes to start preparing for season two. For updated information on the season two release date and possible bonus episodes, go follow me at Cold Canada Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And as always, I'd appreciate a rating and review on Apple Podcasts if you have enjoyed any or all of the past 13 episodes. Thank you again for an incredible season and see you all in 2021. My name is Heather Curran and this has been Cold Canada. Mm-hmm.